Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the HDFC Bank Fireside Chat on Digital Initiatives Conference Call hosted by Macquarie. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Suresh Ganpati from Macquarie. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Rutuja. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Macquarie Insights uh, Fireside Chat Session with the Senior Management of HDFC Bank. This is Suresh Ganpati, the Head of Financial Services Research at Macquarie India. From the senior management team of HDFC Bank, we have with us today Srinivasan Maidinadan, the Chief Financial Officer, Parag Rao, Country Aid Payments, Technology and Digital Banking, and Anjani Rathor, the Chief Digital Officer, and Ajit Shetty from Investor Relations. Um, I think we are going to follow a, a pretty different format whereby we are trying to engage in a fireside chat session um, with the management where uh, I'm likely to ask very pointed questions on some of the uh, most uh, recent issues um, concerning the bank. So maybe it, it goes on for a bit of bit amount of time and then later on as and when time permits, I will open up the floor for any questions for investors. So um, thanks, um, um, uh, thanks to the HDFC Bank management to agree to do this call. So let me just um, uh, address the elephant in the room, and this is to um, all the three um, people out here: Parag, Anjani, and Srini. Um, I think the the uh, the predominant feedback that I, as an analyst, am getting from a lot of long onlys and a lot of um, funds out here um, is that uh, the bank is under investing in technology, and that's the fear that a lot of people have. Um, how much of these tech issues that you have faced in the past? We know what those issues were, but uh, has got to do with the fact that there has been some kind of an underinvestment and therefore a cash up needs to be done or has it got to do with the complexity of the technology infrastructure whereby so you have a legacy system on top of that you're trying to build in a new system so how do you address this um, a particular issue and specifically to Srini after Parag and Anjani answers does it necessarily mean that you will have to make more investments therefore greater costs and therefore higher cost ratios over to you Parag and Anjani um okay okay i to set the sort of stage i think i'll i'll, I'll let sort of shrini lead into it he's been sort of talking about this at multiple fora uh, lead into it and then you know I, uh, suresh if you don't mind i will change the order slightly i'll let shrini start off and yeah. then anjani and me will pitch in with the okay. details wherever required that's yeah? okay that's fine shrini if that's okay with you okay okay sure you know perfectly good uh, good afternoon uh, thank you thank you all this is a very apt uh, question to to answer and, and think about, right? Uh, one is that uh, wh whether the uh, underinvestment in technology or overinvestment are right about is a, is a very relative matter and it's a subjective matter, as you know, right? Uh, and if you if we think which we benchmark all the time to see how we are spending, and uh, which in in a few occasions I think in the past uh, we have addressed it uh, maybe four quarters, eight quarters ago in terms of what is it, right, in terms of our spend. Uh, call it, uh, in ballpark, when you say that, uh, call it two and a half, two point eight, three percent 2.8, 3% of our revenues, net revenues, or call it anywhere between 8, 9, 10% of our expenses uh, in technology. Uh, that's very much in terms of when we look at uh, various uh, uh, benchmark ourselves, so there's no published data across anywhere. Uh, when, we, when we look at where we are versus uh, the rest, uh, at least through a, through a professional organization and and benchmark ourselves, we think we are in the ballpark there and uh, pretty much uh, in terms of what, what we do. The second thing to keep in mind is also from a cost spend point of view, uh, the bank always optimizes on several costs and that, that's one of the costs we try to optimize. And you know that it is a mix of both uh, technology spend that we do uh, in-house and the technology that we outsource and get things done, right? Uh, either in, in either case, uh, we try to optimize as, be, as best as we can. That means get it done in an efficient manner. That, that's how you must think, and that is why you see where we are from a cost efficiency point of view, not just on this item, on every item, right? Uh, so it doesn't mean that if uh, if our cost to income is sub 40, 
and somebody else's cost to income is a 50 or a 60 somebody is spending more uh, and that it is robustness in in terms of spending it doesn't mean that. so that's one thing to keep in mind and and it's a relative item the second aspect to think about is in terms of what is it that we have spent and what is it that we will do that goes to your second and third aspect of your of your question uh, in terms of what we have spent uh, in in digital call, go back five years seven years ago and if you think back uh, after after the uh, renaissance period on technology where uh, the bank moved into uh, kind of a both from a credit risk analytics marketing and the front end relationship point of view right uh, which is the call it the crm the sales process uh, and all of that other things that come, which is uh, mostly in the front end, deployed between the risk management, marketing and sales and uh, relationship on the front end. Uh, we've, been, we've been one of the uh, cutting edge in terms of getting it done. And that started, I guess, with the, with the process of uh, doing the 10 second loan, for example, right? Uh, it requires a lot of uh, technology investments to get that done. And, and so that, that is one, one, one example. The other thing is that uh, since it is all on the back side, back end that you uh, legacy investments that you said are technology, uh, that is uh, more of a, this is a, all the vendor provided uh, applications and systems, right? And it's built over a period of time. It's monolithic built one top of the other and they are all deeply coupled, right? That is, that's how things have, have worked out on the back end. Now we have, we have come to a kind of a stage where uh, we want to decouple and, and spend a little different, differently. Uh, and so that goes to the last part of your uh, question in terms of, uh, do you think uh, you're going to spend more or invest more? Uh, the way we have started to think right now, at least in the last eight months, nine months, we started to think about is we are not benchmarking ourselves with another bank from our technology capability and, and the infrastructure build point of view. The, the benchmark is the tech majors. That is the kind of a benchmark that we are thinking about. And again, I want to give you an example and say that that's the kind of a thought process we are having. So if you think about uh, Amazon, if you think about Netflix or Google, you will hardly hear of any kind of an outage or any kind of a user disruption from a, from a use point of view. You would not see. That doesn't mean they do not have any disruption or they do not have any outage. They all have. Everybody has got. But however, from the front end, from a customer experience point of view, you do not see any disruption. That is because of certain uh, engineering adoption that has happened. Uh, and uh, the banks have been, uh, that, that is based on our kind of a, uh, study and our kind of a, an analysis. But uh, when you do, you'll see the, find the same, which is banks are typically five, 10 years or even more behind in technology adoption. And again, because of the, of the monolithic nature of the legacy systems that have been built on top of the other, it is difficult to change. Whereas these tech majors are very nimble uh, and they go change and make it overnight and their engineering is of the latest order. And so it is much more easier to get there. And that is where we are trying to benchmark and move ourselves into that uh, approach uh, where uh, our partnerships are being focused towards that to ensure that uh, we move and benchmark and adopt technologies. And that includes people, uh, bringing in people of that kind of a mindset, that kind of a skill set, uh, getting the processes changed in terms of how uh, we adopt agile methodologies and we adopt part structure and committee structures to get the decisions done and execution uh, done rather than have, having things in serial, which is the traditional method of any development and implementation. And uh, so we are, we are moving towards that kind of an approach. And then what does that, does, does, does that do? It also takes the bank uh, to the place where various of these kind of uh, tech or uh, e-commerce and other players are and bring the, take the bank to the customer rather than bring the customer to the bank. It, it tries to reverse and that is the kind of a thought process it goes. And uh, uh, now getting to the last aspect in terms of the spend, yes, uh, we are making a lot of investments in, in which, or we'll talk, Parag, Anjini will talk about the enterprise factory and the digital factory uh, verticals that we have set up, uh, which calls for a different skills and different processes and people uh, adoption, which we are, we are trying to do. And this, over a period of time, 
uh, will completely take the legacy systems into a different order and uh, uh, it will bring the new systems in the digital platform uh, into, into cloud and get, get a greater customer experience, both from an uh, onboarding customer, giving better customer experience, and enabling various partnerships, and all of that uh, is encompassed in this. And there are milestones and deliverables uh, that, that we have against all each one of these. And uh, yes, in the short run, you will see that there is a, quite an amount of investment we will make. Uh, but uh, whether the 36 or 37 we have in cost to income will get to uh, big order, yeah, it could get to 38, 39, it can get to 40. But uh, over a period of time, it should come back to mid 30s that we've been talking about, again, due to the scale and the efficiencies that all of these will bring. And that is what the previous investment in technology did. Previous investment in technology was trying to automate things and bring things straight through and thereby reap the efficiencies. Now, these investments are trying to get greater customer experience and bring in better engineering. That is what this, this kind of a round of investments are trying to aim to get at. Uh, Parag, you want to take it from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rini. Um, for for that for that wonderful sort of uh, entry into this question, um, thank you very much, uh, Suresh, for giving us this opportunity to talk to everyone here and and our customers here. Um, I, I'll take on from from where Srini sort of left off. Um, exactly as he said, our previous investments in technology over the last ten years focused on a lot of HCP, a lot of um, you know automation at the back end, and and a large portion of what you saw on the PNL. Uh, in terms of cost to income, et cetera, et cetera, dropping has, has, has been an outcome of that. Uh, come, come this area right now, uh, what's the thrust of our, uh, of our investments and the direction in which technology and digital is taking? Um, as as, uh, as Srin said, one part uh, of our investments and our focus, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, how it is structured a little later, uh, is to focus on even further improving, digitizing a lot of the back-end processes decoupling a lot of our monolithic um, investments into legacy systems, making them that much more agile uh, and nimble, etc. So that's one part of the investment. Uh, this is absolutely required because we are a large running bank, as you know, we are you know, 16 million plus customers, we are a running bank, we, are, we have significantly large volumes across all the businesses in which we are in. When I say all, I don't mean just talk, talk of retail, but also talk of the wholesale, treasury, investment, etc., the, the entire bank. Uh, and so, so it, it probably, we are flying the plane at 36,000 feet, we've got to take the plane to 40,000 feet, at the same time we've got to We've got to improve processes, add two more engines here. We've got to, you know, fix the aerolons and, and, and do a lot of stuff, etc. Because we're a running engine, and so and 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 this this focus area is what is housed under what we are calling the enterprise factory, which is essentially run and modernize the bank. And there's a significant amount of work and investment actually going in, uh, influx of new technologies, decoupling um, to ensure that a lot of the activities are fail safe. Uh, API driven, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, that's that's the role of the enterprise factory, which we've talked about before. Uh, run and modernize the current bank. Uh, there's a second uh, leg of this tool, or the leg of the, our, our strategy, which is what we call the digital factory. The digital factory focuses on building, uh, building products, platforms, processes, and of course competencies and people competencies also in the digital space. This digital space are the newer ways uh, in which we're working when you compare legacy or monolithic systems to the newer ways in many of the uh, non-bank players of sort of uh, pain, completely uh, agile, cloud-based, uh, primarily mobile-driven uh, interfaces, uh, wonderful customer UI UXs, uh, ease of information on the fly, a significant amount of use of AI, uh, ML, not just for the customer, but also to drive a lot of operational efficiency. These require uh, different, a different set of skill sets and a different approach, um, not just in terms of the design approach, but also in terms of the engineering approach, uh, come in uh, new practices like DevSecOps, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are being developed um, as we speak 
uh, under un, under uh, the digital factory. Uh, uh, Anjani will talk a little more about the kind of projects which we're doing under the digital factory. But so that's the second leg of our uh, of our core strategy. The third leg of our core strategy is we're developing uh, uh, multiple center of excellences. Uh, you may call so you call them different names, but we choose to call them center of excellences. These center of excellences will work on large strategic projects which are sort of going to take it, take us into the future, and uh, and developing core competencies. Let's say in the mobile space, let's say in the payment space, let's say in 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 blockchain, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, important uh, investments to be made for the future. But these are the building blocks of of the future. As as Srini rightly said, uh, this is a journey. Uh, we're moving from a situation where banks, like I said, uh, from monolithical legacy structures to a much more nimble, agile framework of operating. Uh, two focus areas, obviously, focus on building a lot of operational efficiency at the back end by digitizing all the processes, decoupling our systems, uh, building in fail safe measures, um, building in early warning systems doing uh, network monitoring on the fly so that you know well in advance where probable choke points could be happening, knowing at one point in time, at any point in time, 24 by 7, what's happening across our entire large network or the, uh, the entire system, and driving this whole uh, huge volume of transactions, etc., which we, which we today also host and will grow uh, in an efficient manner. And the second part of, uh, of that is, is in building fantastic um, uh, customer experiences uh, so that uh, not just when when customers come to us, come to us as a bank, but they can avail of our products and services, but even taking the bank to the customer. Uh, Srini talked about that briefly, uh, which is what we may call today banking as a service. So, you know, how can you avail and ensure that the banking services through digital means uh, are made available at the point in which customers would like to transact? As I said, not in the traditional banking domain, but even outside of the domain through APIs, uh, etc. And that's where a large portion of our partnership strategies come in. Okay, uh, so 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 as I said, leading into this partnership strategy, the partners partnerships which we'll be doing, a lot of them strategic partnerships, will be assisting us a lot in uh, building this uh, modern infrastructure. Okay, uh, that's one part of uh, and, and thrust of the of our partnerships. And the second thrust of our partnerships will be in 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 creating. Uh, and taking the bank even further to the customer in um, through digital interfaces, um, extremely uh, agile and nimble, uh, 24 by 7 sort of infrastructure wherein customers at the point of at the point of purchase or at the point in which they choose to sort of interact with can also avail of banking services. That's where a lot of the strategy front end, if you may call strategic partnerships, are, are, are sort of going on. Uh, we we have quite a few. Uh, in the pipeline, we've used the last eight months uh, to, to to actually uh, so, sort of fine tune uh, our strategies on all fronts: the customer uh, experience end front, our strategic partnerships and alliances at the front end, um, building up the edifices for the structure uh, for for this transformation which we're doing. Uh, we've used that well, and we do believe we've got a, a great plan on hand. Mind you, I must tell you that. Uh, this is a journey. Transformation is a journey, as you would be aware. Even globally, many of the banks have gone through the journey. Or, uh, actually, not even gone. They're still going through the journey. These take typically anywhere between three to five years. Uh, we've started out uh, on a journey. And, of course, we've, we've laid out various milestones. which could be short-term, medium-term, and long-term. Uh, but our endeavor is, 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 is to sort of uh, be ready. Uh, um, over the period of the next 12 to 18 months to 24 months uh, to, to the new demands of which customers require in the digital space. Uh, I'll pause here and then uh, we'll take Anjay and I'll uh, ask the request Anjay to take us through some of the details of, the, of our digital journey and, and what's the thrust of our digital journey and how, how sort of uh, we are sort of tackling all of this new technology and how we're partnering uh, to sort of build our uh, infrastructure for the future. Anjani? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, for Anjani, our... just sorry, and yeah. just when you uh, when you're about to speak on digital factory, also please let us let the investors know what you can do and what you can't, because we really don't know what is under digital 2.0 and what RBI has prevented you from doing it. So, so we just wanted to clearly understand when you can be completely doing some of the things which you're planning to speak about. Thanks, Anjani. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, as Parag mentioned, the competencies and capabilities that we are building. Um, one is, of course, the enterprise IT, which we have known as technology for so long. The new muscle that we are building is on the uh, digital factory side, where we are working on platforms and programs that will allow us better engagement with customers. There, we have chosen a program. Um, and, and I'll share some of the details around that. Um, the enterprise factory is essentially focusing on how to connect these engagement layers and programs with the enterprise IT, which already exists with us. So things like API factory or uh, working on data plumbing, which allows us to do move data across systems and working on several other technology capabilities, uh, which are new in nature, falls within the enterprise factory. Now, as, as far as the uh, programs are concerned, we've been working on programs that, which are short-term and which are long-term, both in nature. For example, um, there are certain things that we need to do to ensure that the monitoring of the systems are happening better, there's a better resiliency, uh, there are regular drills conducted so that systems are working fine. Those kind of uh, measures are already being taken across enterprise IT. On the longer term horizon, uh, any new thing which is getting built, we are moving towards cloud. Uh, all the development is, is being done in a cloud um, environment. We are using microservices, zero trust architecture. We are not going in for monolith systems. Those kind of changes are, are being done with the new programs. As far as the digital 2.0 is concerned, um, this is actually a philosophy of reimagining. Um, and uh, we had embarked on some programs uh, which were connecting various ecosystem players uh, like in auto. There is a way in which uh, auto loan is delivered. What happens if we reimagine that experience and create a completely new way of delivering loans for auto where a customer can walk into any of the dealerships or go come onto a website or go to a site and take end-to-end -end, uh, loan in a matter of 30 minutes. You will be able to get loan disbursed uh, to a dealer for buying an automobile. Likewise, if you look at healthcare, uh, in that area as well, how do we simplify the experience for our customers who are actually walking into a hospital and all of a sudden they realize that they need 5 lakh rupee loan for an important surgery that has to be urgently done. Can we enable our customers to get loan immediately so that the money moves into their account in a matter of few minutes? Um, another example is connecting the rural ecosystem. This is a you know, semi-urban and rural ecosystem is a big focus area for us and lots of... Uh, uh, enablement is to be done over there digitally so that we can open accounts seamlessly, we can transfer money, our customers are able to take loans from us. So those are the kind of reimagination that is being done and a lot of these are actually long term in nature. A short term embargo would actually not impact um, these programs because it's not that something is coming today and, and something is to come next month. The short term programs are very much on track and we are able to go and deploy those. Only some of the fundamentals where we are reimagining the journey will get uh, to some extent uh, delayed because of embargo, but it's not even coming right now. It's under development. It's going to take a few months for us to get ready uh, to be there. Thanks, um, Anjali. Uh, pretty clear. Okay, so there are <laughs> there is a second elephant in the room. Uh, so um, so let me address that, which is basically uh, the fintech space, right? So um, you know the, there are different views. Some believe fintechs are disruptors. Some believe fintechs are enablers. Of course, there's a lot of noise surrounding the uh, the possible IPOs of some of the large fintech players. So we just wanted to know from both uh, uh, Parag as well as Anjani as to how are you looking at the fintech space? Of course, you recently announced the partnership with Paytm also. I mean, what prompted you to do so? So what exactly is the fintech bringing to you on the table that you can't do as a bank? And do you perceive them as big threats who are going to eat away your lunches? Specifically for you, Parag, you also need to answer us, how are these BNPL guys going to take away your credit card market share? If at all, they can do that. So over okay. to you, Parag and Anjani. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Thank you, lovely question. I'm glad that you asked that question. Uh, the way we see it in the bank, uh, for us, fintechs are the first word which you mentioned. Are they enablers or are they disruptors? They're actually enablers. Uh, that's the way we see the space. Uh, there are ample enough examples of what many fintechs, maybe not all the fintechs, but many fintechs have actually done in several industries and actually expanding the marketplace. 
created actually uh, what do you say demand or if you may call so consumption capabilities when they were not there by merely you know what do you say offering um, uh, great customer experiences a completely different way of looking at transactions consumption uh, especially helping a lot of the way and, and, and given the situation which India was in post demonetization as I said the huge drive of digitization moving people away from cash and moving them onto electronic uh, uh, ways of consumption uh, what we call generically digital I think they've done a good job UPI for example is probably the well UPI is not technically a fintech but, uh, but but UPI for example is one great example of what has actually expanded the market for digital payments and uh, and as you see uh, and that is where all know digit UPI is actually sort of uh, eaten into cash uh, so while cash continues to grow, but I think uh, very clearly the, uh, they've eaten a lot into cash. Also, given the nature of the kind of spends, the low ticket size spends, the kind of MCCs where typically UPI is spent. UPI is one example. Uh, we give example of this uh, ordering food out and eating. Uh, I'm a firm believer that they have significantly expanded the cuisine in India. Um, probably if you analyze each one of our behaviors, we've all started eating more, much more. And the variety of food which you started ordering at each one of house, I think, has gone up farther than what, much more than what it was five years back. They've essentially sort of, um, uh, sort of a given, given a long lease of life to many uh, sort of eateries, restaurants, etc. by extending uh, the, the horizons of their demand. Uh, and, ho and home and takeaway sort of has become a very great demand. It's also also obviously created a lot of employment uh, for uh, employment opportunities for the Ola Uber segment, taxi segment. Again, has seen a lot of uh, significant um, uh, ramp up in the kind of you know space uh, demand which you've seen, and so on and so forth. So 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 Suresh, uh, the way we see it as they actually sort of help out, enable, coming uh, actually expand the marketplace. Uh, uh, and, and that's number one, uh, and they also sort of uh, uh, are driving a lot of adoption of consumers to sort of take on this space. So, so clearly, clear, clear, and, and and I think we must admit that I don't think there's any one player in any industry you can do that all alone. Um, yeah, I think it's a combined effort. So, expansion of marketplace, I think, uh, is, is a fantastic thing. One key thing which we see uh, coming in. Uh, so, 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 so therefore, we see them as enablers. What they clearly bring to the table, obviously, is fintechs, is new ways of working, great platform, digital platforms, great customer experiences, a different way of thinking uh, as far as customer interactions are concerned. Okay, uh, having said this, fintechs are also in the space business, I presume, um, of building top line and more importantly, building um, a, you know a, a profitable business model in the in in the sort of medium to long term, uh, and so therefore things like scale. Things like deepening engagement with customers become extremely uh, important parts of, of, of the thing. Uh, and, and that's probably, let me say, one of the reasons that we figured out that, um, that this, uh, our strategy of, of, of uh, partnering with select uh, fintechs or e-tailers uh, in this space actually is, is almost a win-win situation. Um, uh, one is because, as I said, uh, we bring to the table, or the, or the partner brings to the table, uh, wonderful customer experiences and a different way of approaching a particular transaction, um, uh, uh, and, and obviously a lot of good digital skill sets. Okay, what the bank brings to the table is clearly our years of experience of of underwriting in case it's an asset product, uh, our ability to manage significant scale and volumes uh, <coughs> in the very large operational interface which we've sort of created, uh, our very large uh, set of uh, deeply engaged customers uh, in the financial space, in the financial space which we've sort of built up over the last 25 years, and of course uh, a very strong uh, brand name, one of the best brand names in in the in the BFSI space. Uh, this this is what we bring to the table, uh, and and if you therefore see that the, that the individual strengths brought brought to the table by say a bank like us and their fintech actually are pretty complementary and they make for good business sense to be able to offer not just the uh, the fintechs or the e-tailers products and services but also the banking services on a wonderful digital platform which can, which is typically co-created um, 
uh, and together, like I said, bring together the strengths and, and actually offer great value to customers um, in, in a way that probably never happened before. So, so Suresh, we look at them as enablers and therefore we, we uh, an important part of our growth strategy um, over the next um, multiple years will be partnering with select um, fintechs or non-banking partners, if you may call so, uh, obviously within the ambit, uh, within the uh, guidelines of the regulation in, under which uh, banks operate under, okay, but to bring significant uh, value to customers which probably wasn't available earlier. So we see them, like I said, as partners, uh, at, least, at least a lot of the select ones, and the announcement which you saw uh, recently and a couple of more, many more, which will happen over the next um, couple of months uh, are with that in the spirit. Specifically coming down to your BNPL, exactly the same philosophy. BNPL, how do we see, what are we defining as BNPL? BNPL is fundamentally funding at the point of purchase for typical small ticket transactions. Um, in a nutshell, that's what we sort of call as BNPL. Um, and, 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 and in that sense also, I think the number of players, uh, obviously, which have sort of come into the BNPL space over the last at least definitely one year, has done exactly what I just now mentioned, has helped sort of expand the market, has helped educate um, uh, customers about the merits of taking funding for smaller ticket transactions, has also helped enable a lot of the customers who in the traditional sense would not have sort of got, um, um, what do you say, funding, um, uh, and in that sense have also increased consumption. The way we look at as a bank, BNPL, is exactly uh, the, the same way is that it's an extension of our of, of the bank's uh, consumer finance business and the car DMI as you traditionally sort of know. Uh, and in that sense, if you if you actually look at, uh, we, we, we have, if you expand the definition of BNPL to even uh, taking into account any transaction below say 50, 60,000, we're, we're, we're probably all, already the largest player in this space um, by providing uh, EMI uh, products and services at the point of purchase. Uh, we also have products uh, which enable conversion of full transactions into EMI post the purchase. Also, if you actually take put that uh, take that together, um, uh, that's already a very large volume and probably the largest already in the industry. Um, that those are like I said, typically focused on transactions uh, of a slightly higher ticket size, maybe about twenty twenty five thousand. Um, um, ticket size. The BNPL, as we know it, is a focus on a lot of transactions which are typically in the average range of three, four, five thousand, six thousand rupees. Uh, here, our strategy is once again also to partner. You would have noticed in our uh, uh, that this is one of our legs of our uh, alliance, which you talked about with Paytm. And and here we will ride on a very large acceptance infrastructure which we've created. So we are co-creating products and also creating our own products which will offer. EMI at uh, all merchant outlets, both in the physical space and in the online space. And for us, as I said, it's an extension of, 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 of our existing uh, funding business, uh, consumer finance business to be called so, which is funding at the point of purchase uh, to also cover a lot of the smaller ticket size transactions. Uh, so once again, as I said in summary, even the BNPL space we see as growing right now. Uh, the fintech players who come in have actually sort of uh, help expand the market, help uh, customers adopt and become much more aware of these funding options. Uh, <coughs> our, our strategy in this space will be to also partner and, and, and take our BNPL product to our entire very large and growing acceptance merchant base, uh, which is essentially funding transactions at the point of purchase with the, the moment of truth. Um, uh, and, and so, and, and so we've also got very aggressive and, and, and positive plans on the BNPL front. Yeah, Parag, before I go on to Anjani, quickly just extending this BNPL thing, I want you to be honest and say who calls the shots because the experience of some of the BNPL guys has not been great. Some of them are reporting 15 to 20% kind of an NPL ratio. So do mm -hmm. you define your underwriting standards? How will you go about credit selection? Because clearly the new to credit customers and small ticket loans is not necessarily creating a great experience for a, for a large section of BNPL players. So how are you going about calling the shots here? Okay, so clearly, clearly in our case, our, our philosophy from a credit perspective continues to remain. We um, we got a two-pronged strategy on that. Okay, very clearly on credit, we call the shots. 
okay, we will decide as a bank uh, whom we want to underwrite, whom we want to sort of give a loan. Obviously, we're looking at credit now slightly differently because of the nature of the uh, lending which we're doing. These are smaller ticket size transactions. These are customers who are transacting on instruments already, etc., and, 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 and a lot of things. Uh, uh, one w w one key addition which will come in, which is the second way which we're looking at underwriting in this space, is that the partner too, uh, and that's one key advantage which I forgot to mention in the early, uh, in, earlier, is that one of the key advantages when we partner with large uh, other large players in this space is that they too bring a lot of customer data to the table, <coughs> and when we take the bank's experience in underwriting using a lot of uh, current data, and a lot of the newer data which the partner brings to the table, we, uh, we, we have what we have uh, is actually a formula to improve our underwriting, look at different means, get more additional information on the customer. This is done in a very, if you may call it secure manner, uh, but that's one clear ad advantage of, or uh, uh, rather outcome of uh, partnerships. So, so that's the second prong of our strategy, mind you. Uh, these are uh, credit scores, as you know, are iterative in nature. You build one today, and then you run your business through those algorithms, and you keep on sort of improving uh, and, and keep on using analytics to to, to 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 you know shave off the bad areas and sort of keep on focusing on the good areas. So it's an iterative process. But this is fundamentally the approach which you're going to take in BNPL uh, to specifically answer your question. I think the credit is the is the complete prerogative of the bank. Uh, in this particular case, we hold the book, uh, uh, and, and the partners bring, as I said, uh, uh, a great experience, digital platforms, uh, dig ways of digiti digitally disbursing the loans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, 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 in a remote manner. Yeah, uh, thanks, Parag. And Anjali, the question as a chief digital officer to you is that, um, you know, how do you, how do you, for example, differentiate your digital offerings compared to what, say, the fintech's digital offerings are? Because we clearly want to know what the difference is and how, um, say, for example, your role in the last 18 to 24 months or responsibility has changed as a CDO because the CDOs in a lot of global banks wield quite a lot amount of power in terms of influencing certain decisions and stuff. So we just wanted to understand from your perspective, Purely from a digital experience perspective, what are you bringing to the table related to the syntax and how do you go about doing this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, over the last 18 months, definitely the the role of a digital officer has um, you know changed significantly. There has been a lot of pull from businesses now uh, to make things happen, leveraging technology. Technology, you know, prior to a few years ago was largely an enabler. Now it has become a differentiator because that can actually be a difference between a winning and losing, um, you know, market leadership positions. So as a result, um, a lot of businesses actually sit together with us to ensure that we are making the right choices on building the correct platforms which are going to drive businesses. And as we do that, the fundamental uh, strength that the bank brings uh, always remains consistent. So if you look at a bank like ours, uh, we do excellent quality KYC, we do good capability, uh, we have excellent capabilities in underwriting, we bring a lot of uh, data intelligence in, in doing personalization, uh, fraud and risk control. Those are the capabilities that are fundamental to the bank and how do we bring all these together in a platform using applications or APIs or analytics is, is the real thing that we work on. And once we build that platform, then it can be exposed at banks, digital properties, which could be our mobile banking or net banking, or it could also be extended at FinTech partners that Parag is referring to. And when it gets exposed to FinTech partners, they are actually extending our distribution and reach. So if we create a journey to open a savings account, which is instantaneous, which gives you a savings account, which is a full KYC account with a video KYC, it is open for even our FinTech partners. So they can expose the same APIs at their front end. And uh, you know, a commerce partner like Bank Bazaar could actually expose it over there. And any customer who is coming there looking to open an account can actually open a, a HDFC bank account where we do the full KYC at the back end and the customer comes back into the core banking system. So uh, there is an experience that a partner brings on their site, which are powered by apps, APIs, and analytics that the bank brings. 
and the same apps, APIs, and analytics also creates uh, excellent experiences at our website. For example, we are using a, Adobe Forms to, to create journeys where customers are getting onboarded in a seamless manner. But other partners may use different technologies to create engagement layer, but the capability is the common one that we, we use it for our site or at our partner site. Thanks, Anjani. Um, operator, I think we can open up the floor for some questions from investors. Can you please announce the Q&A thing? Thank you very much. So then now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue is sending. The first question is from the line of Prasun Agarwal from BlackRock. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thanks to the team from HGC Bank. This is very insightful. I have two questions. First question is on the credit card part. Um, you know, uh, I, I just want to understand, like, what's the thought process here and if you can share some numbers. Uh, for example, we are pushing a lot of incentives to the customer through our Smart Buy platform, which is, uh, let's say, a little bit cumbersome, but of course beneficial to the customer, but it, it requires customer to go and do some more work. Uh, whereas, let's say, if I can specifically name competition, like ICICI Bank is doing a co-branded card with Amazon, which is doing really well for them. And as I understand, they don't really make a lot of money directly on that card, but it is providing a lot of other benefits and branding efforts to them. So uh, how how does bank think about, you know, uh, first strategy versus other, which which means uh, maybe Smart Buy is more profitable to us, but, but from a customer point of view, probably the other strategy makes more sense. And the other question, maybe after after this, I'll ask the second question. Thanks. Um, okay, I think the strategies are uh, are sort of completely different. The way, sorry, I, I'll talk about this comparison, which you talked about, you know, clearly said, and then I'll get to the larger point about um, uh, alliances, etc. So uh, our focus on uh, on our card portfolio has always been on deepening the engagement, and so therefore, whatever value we bring to the table. Whether it be platforms like Smart Buy, whether it be larger platforms like Festive Treats, whether it be the synergy between our very large acceptance footprint and the large issuing play which we have, I've been focused on sort of delivering more value. And 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 and, and to give you an example, as I said, very clearly Smart Buy, which is an option, which is very clearly a, a, a wonderful place to get the best of deals. Uh, a lot of them uh, brought to brought to them by the merchants whom we acquire are for giving significant value for HGFC Bank customers and, and, and we clearly see a significant amount of traction uh, uh, coming on to uh, customers um, by using our but that's only one platform. Uh, the second platform which we've created, which is Festive Treats, which we do typically uh, twice a year, uh, one is just around the corner in the traditional sort of Festive Treats, is to actually bring the, en the entire um, uh, family of large merchants our length and breadth of merchants, physical merchants, and online merchants uh, to, uh, on, on, on to one day, one platform, and to bring our entire um, uh, set of customers, uh, 30, 32 million debit card customers, and 15 odd million credit card customers, again on the same table, so that during the festive period, they actually get significant enhanced value where the merchant offering HDFC Bank customers uh, great deals, especially during the festive season, uh, and, and, and in a sense, therefore, drive traffic to those specific merchants. These are values which we continuously bring in. It's not about just a simple cashback. I think customers have evolved today beyond a point to realize which instruments and which of their service providers can actually provide them a longer term value versus, you know, just a promo for 10 days or 15 days where you sort of get a, a, a cashback. And, and so, therefore, our endeavor, our portfolio management, which we've driven, has always been to consistently keep on doing this. Uh, part of our strategy, our, uh, our, our partnership strategy, our strategic alliance partner strategy, which includes co-brands, is exactly in tune with this to bring a relevant set of benefits to specific customer segments uh, and therefore go completely deeper into, into that, uh, that segment. And mind you, we are also very clear 
that whatever partnership we do, we finally running a business, uh, a, a, a card business, which not just engages customers deeply, but also is ultimately profitable. Okay, and 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 and, and, and that's been our endeavor uh, to really do that. Uh, I don't think we're in the business of sort of. Uh, sort of making significant losses on a continuous basis, but that aside, um, I, as I said, we've had a we, we have a very strong, deep, and uh, a consistent portfolio approach to our customers by giving them value across multiple or the spend basket across the entire spend basket which customers do. Cobrands is one of one of the tools in which you do it. The strategic platform which you've created are, are another tool, and of course, consistent. Being consistently being in touch with customers um, uh, on a month-on-month -month basis, uh, that's the edifice of our strong portfolio strategy, and hence the reason why we drive um, our significant value market share, both on the issuing side and the acquiring side, which you'll be aware we have close to one-third the spend share in the marketplace. Um, uh, on the debit card side, as you're aware, we have the second highest spend in the industry, not, even though we're not the largest debit card issuer in the country. Uh, and on the acquiring side, we have another very significant 40-50% uh, kind of market share uh, of acquired volumes which flow through the HDFC bank network. Um, uh, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. And, and my second question is uh, actually related to the account aggregator network that is just uh, launched in India and the, 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 you know, the future credit layer which might be built on top. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, once this network is live and once there is an account aggregator who has all the data of an individual across platforms, and mm -hmm. that data can be used to offer credit, what is the what is the uniqueness or what is the, uh, I mean, would having your own customer still be valuable or uh, having any customer outside the network would provide similar value as having your own customer in, in that framework? Uh, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take that question. See, even today, if somebody wants to ask a customer that get your bank statement and then I'm going to look at that bank statement and do credit underwriting to you, it's very much possible. Customer has to just go physically to a bank, ask for the statement and give it to the person who's going to lend money. Now, account aggregator actually allows that to be simplified with the consent of the citizen. And uh, there are FIPs and FIUs. These are the ones who contribute data and use are the ones who are users of data. And this is a very fair model actually. The model is such that people who are contributing data are the ones who are going to use the data as well. So if let's say um, uh, one bank has 8% market share and is contributing 8% of the data, the remaining 92% of the data is also coming and it's made available there. So it, it just simplifies, makes the process safe and secure, and then the rest of the banking capability still has to come into play to provide uh, either credit or any kind of a portfolio management service that has to be offered to the customer. It just makes it a lot more safer, and it's a lot more protected ecosystem. Understood. So, so just to be clear, so it means that that data would be available to everyone on that system, and then how you use it is based on your capability. Yeah, but it is not automatically available. Let's say you come to HDFC Bank and you want to come and ask for a loan from HDFC Bank, and you are a, not a bank customer. Uh, you are able to share data from your another bank account through this method, and it is available to the to the company which is wanting to lend. But that's just one source of information. And it is starting with financial services, but tomorrow it will go to telecom data that can be made available, healthcare data. So citizens' data is actually the, the prerogative of the citizen who he or she wants to share with. And this entire national rail is going to allow that in a very safe manner. Thank you. See, the point is it is not automatic. One, your consent will be required which today, when you want a loan from HDFC Bank, you provide a, a copy of your other bank statement today. Instead of providing a copy of the other bank statement, you provide the consent to HDFC Bank to take it from the aggregate resource. And to the extent that the other bank where you got an account is a participant, is providing data in that, we will be able to pull it straight away, straight through. Thank you. That answers your question, Mr. Agrawal. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants to ask a question, please press star and 1. The next question is from the line of Abhinav Rathi from C Worldwide Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for uh, the very interesting presentation you made. Um, and, and since you spoke about, you know, benchmarking yourselves to the tech majors, which I suppose should be the right approach, um, what are the changes that you think you need to make or you have made um, towards changing the culture of the organization or especially the technology team, uh, the hiring process, if you have to compete with the tech majors? So I, I'll take that question uh, if it's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so Go ahead. Here, here we are working on, um, you know, full 360 enablement. As you heard earlier that we are creating newer muscles like uh, digital factory, enterprise factory, which is um, a, where how we are going to embed new technologies, we are going to get new skills, and there is a new way of working. So all three are coming together. Let's look at the, the new skills which are coming in. We have to attract some of the best talent and technology which is available uh, in the Indian talent pool here and attract them to come and work with us and some of the key programs that we are uh, where we are working on building great platforms and amazingly great uh, customer experience so uh, we have to attract good talent for people to come in and work on these uh, good platforms that we are building uh, which each of these in their own right would be like a very big organization in future because each of these are competing with some of the best platforms available in the country today <coughs> So it's a full 360 approach of uh, the ways of working, you know, attracting new talent and building new technologies here. If I if I may add uh, one one more thing uh, from that sense, right? Not only bringing in the the kind of the best, but there is a process to bring in those skill sets, which is uh, if you have to attract people, right? If in the hierarchy of attraction, if you see what happens today. Uh, the first attraction is the big platform players, tech players. That's the first attraction. The second attraction is the tech startups. That's why if you don't go into the, the tech majors, you go and think about, and if you have the right mindset, go into do some startups. The third kind of an hierarchy where it goes is that various other uh, tech service providers in the country, right? And then comes everybody else in the hierarchy in terms of how you attract people. Now you want to be right on the top to attract right in the first in the queue to attract which means it calls for a different type of recruitment process different uh, kind of a process of paying for skills like the way uh, the investment bankers or the or the treasury professionals uh, maybe 20 years ago that change happened there right uh, of, of a different order in terms of how you uh, attract and retain them so similar kind of a mindset similar kind of an approach is what we have taken uh, into this and again it is not based on vintage of people or or kind of a particular experience what is the uh, latest engineering experience person has got what is the skill set somebody has got and uh, the, the pay is for the skill more than the pay for the experience right so this is a different kind of an approach uh, is what we are taking and then the other uh, the part of the 360 you was talking is about also the location and the environment to work because you, you know that in some of these places it is a different environment than working in a bank and that that is what we are also creating uh, uh, creating centers in uh, bangalore hyderabad pune and several other places where we are trying to give the similar kind of an environment uh, so that it is not a typical traditional bank environment but we give that kind of an environment even physically for them to work and then from a process point of view we talked about the parts and the committees and how uh, things things can be agile uh, in the manner in which that's what they all uh, like to work uh, and that's what we're trying to provide. Mm, right. Um, uh, right. So, I mean, for most banks, uh, you know, the, 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 the solution, the long-term solution to legacy systems is about retaining them and maintaining them. Uh, as you are reimagining or you have reimagined your digital journey, um, over a period of time, what do you think you would do with a lot of the legacy systems that you're carrying. Okay, I'll take that question. So, mm -hmm. so I, I in the earlier part of my address, I said that since we're a very large running bank with sort of you know very uh, very significant shares in most of our business, 
um, uh, the, the, the strategy which we adopted is exactly this run and modernize the existing sort of legacy systems uh, and that comes under the enterprise factory here here what we're doing in a phased manner in a complete planned manner which is short term medium term and long term we are, we are sort of slowly transforming decoupling if you may call so uh, the legacy system which are very tightly intertwined or hard coded if you may call so into loosely coupled components um, at a very high level we are segregating say the uh, the gl layer which is the bottom most layer gl uh, finally every transaction converts into a credit or debit uh, that's the bottom most layer above that lies the processing layer uh, above the, which essentially processes all the transactions above the layer comes what we call the middleware layer which we, we, which sort of connects uh, any core processing engine to multiple various outputs all of them within the bank and above the process of the middleware layer lies the actually the customer interaction layer uh, the layer which we as consumers actually touch and see and feel okay um, erstwhile all of these were very tightly hard coded and missing and therefore any change any outage involved multiple linkages uh, and it and, and it used to be uh, sort of um, and in today's world becomes actually pretty um, cumbersome to sort of fix or reengineer okay we are loosely coupling coupling those and each each of these layers now the after decoupling will be connected through uh, apis uh, what you call hollowing out the core which means actually taking out the various core processing components segregating that from the customer interaction components um, building up um, storage capacities and processing capacities for each so that each component in a sense focuses on what it's supposed to do rather than sort of taking on the load of of, of a complete system on its back um, this is a this is a process this is one track as we call of our uh, journey uh, the second track which is a parallel track uh, which anjini sort of talked about the digital factory is about building a lot of these capabilities uh, various new competencies and capabilities and new platforms which are built on new age architecture um, and in our road map there is the, 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 uh, over the next 3 to 5 years uh, these these parallel tracks will merge depending on which system or, or and and what time is sort of most convenient to do we have a plan for each one each one of our four components they'll practically merge so that what you get at the end of the merger is uh, are not only two very strong engines which you built over the years but also sort of merging into one core future ready um, completely resilient infinitely scalable uh, nimble architecture uh, approach type core systems so like i said it's a journey which we have sort of already embarked upon but we clearly have milestones for each and every one of our core systems as to how it's going to sort of transform uh, but essentially we are we are fixing and modernizing it as we run and same time as saying i creating and bolting on new cap capabilities and capacities as we grow i hope that answers your question Yes, right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Abhinav. And uh, just quickly, last uh, couple of minutes on a very important uh, regulatory development. Parag, if you can clarify, Parag and Anjali, one is on the the two regulatory changes. One is on the credit card storage rules and the auto debit rules, which are changing right in the next six to twelve months or at the next six months. So, how are you guys? equipping yourself to handle this transition and there is a school of thought that when when there is a friction around these times upi is going to gain greater amount of market share just quickly your couple of minutes view on that yeah okay um, so i take on that so so card on file has been uh, what we call card on file which means merchant storing card data i think has been prevalent in the industry for many number of years right now we all experience that when you go especially online uh, online space whether you go to amazon or any other site Uh, Etc. Uh, the regulation actually now says prohibits um, certain market players not to store a lot of that card data. One number one and number two, it it essentially directs um, that so-called card on file so card data can be stored only by uh, only if there are what we call network solutions. Okay. Now 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 to to answer your earlier talk, question, which you talked about uh, tokenization. So it's actually one ecosystem. Okay. Uh, one part of this safe card or keeping customer data safe is one part of it is the tokenization capability which is essentially converting the card data elements into uh, encrypted uh, encrypted code safe secure code which cannot be sort of cracked 
uh, and the capability to carry that encryption code over a network and encrypt it at the at the starting point and decrypt it at the, uh, 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 at the end point. And the second bit is about storage of these um, of these tokens. Um, the reason why the the regulator uh, so so let me first say I think that it's a it's a great fantastic development uh, or for the industry because it is now taking security to the next level of technology and and, and essentially securitizing the entire network where today traditionally a lot of card data is available um, I, and, and that and it's, a, it's a great step. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons why I think the regulator is insisting on a network solution is that they're looking at a democratic solution on which any number of players, uh, obviously the players need to certify themselves uh, onto data security standards, but any any number of players, whether it's a small player or a big player um, on either sides of the fence that is acquiring side or issuing side can actually sort of hook onto the network solution. Um, uh, and, and, and in that sense, I think it's a pretty forward-looking decision of, of securitizing the entire payment network at the same time, offering a solution which is a common interoperable solution which any person can, can sort of get into. It's, it's moving away from any device-specific or any operator-specific sort of solution. Uh, this is it. But it's a very positive step uh, in that on, of, on, on the progress of tokenization as a bank. Both on the issuing and acquiring side, we are ready, uh, or rather, we've already um, created uh, our, our infrastructure to tokenize. We've already started tokenizing those um, the capabilities. Okay, we, we work closely with uh, the global players like Visa and Master, sort of, um, uh, to tokenize our our instruments, and and uh, we will in fact move to the next stage of tokenization, wherein, uh, wherein soon, very soon, in one of our new uh, um, uh, relaunches of our existing product, okay, you'll be able to actually see the capability of a mobile being able to tap a physical POS machine using tokenization internally, what we call HC, um, uh, uh, tap, tap and do a transaction. Okay, uh, that will be sort of announced in the next couple of months or so. So, so we are well on our, uh, on our journey of tokenization. Okay, uh, thanks um, uh, Parag, thanks Srini and thanks Sanjani for the call. Uh, it's been really a very useful session and thanks all the investors for participating on the call. Thank you so much for your time. Thank today. you. Thank you, Gurej. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Macquarie, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and we may now disconnect your lines.